I wrote the Dune series because I had this idea that charismatic leaders ought to come with a warning label on the forehead may be dangerous to your health. One of the most dangerous presidents that we've had in this century was Jack Kennedy. Because people said, yes sir, Mr. Charismatic Leader, what do we do next? And we wound up in Vietnam. And I think probably the most valuable president of this century was Richard Nixon. Because he taught us to, to distrust government. And he did it by example. Well anyway, I wanted to do this thing about messiahs and charismatic leaders. I mean, why do 900 people go to Guyana and drink poison Kool-Aid? Why do the citizens of an entire nation, most of the citizens anyway, say Sieg Heil and murder some three million Jews and gypsies? Why do they not question their leaders? Such a rich store of myths enfold Paul Muad'Dib, the Mintat Emperor, and his sister, Aaliyah. It is difficult to see the real persons behind these veils, but there were, after all, a man born Paul Atreides and a woman born Aaliyah. Their flesh was subject to space and time and even though their oracular powers placed them beyond the usual limits of time and space, they came from human stock. They experienced real events which left real traces upon a real universe. To understand them, it must be seen that their catastrophe was the catastrophe of all mankind. This work is dedicated then not to Muad'Dib or his sister, but to their heirs, all of us. Each novel in the Dune Saga preceding Dune deals with the effects of Paul's legacy on the known universe. Dune Messiah and Children of Dune most of all. At the start of Messiah, we are immediately faced with the problems surrounding Paul's rule of the Imperium. Dune Messiah opens with a recorded interrogation between a Fremen priest and a historian named Bronzo, who has been labeled a heretic and sentenced to death for his accurate writings on Emperor Paul Muad'Dib. Twelve years have passed since the events of Dune. At this point, Paul Atreides rules from Arrakis as Emperor of the Imperium. Though Paul is the most powerful emperor ever, he is still incapable of stopping the lethal religious excesses of the juggernaut that he has created. The Jihad has been unleashed, and it has conquered most of the known universe. 61 billion people have died so far due to Paul's decision to become the Messiah of the Fremen people. But according to Paul's vision, this is nowhere close to the worst possible outcome for humanity. It is in Dune Messiah that Paul begins the Golden Path, a complex and perilous plan to set humanity on a course that will not lead to its eventual stagnation and extinction. At the same time, Paul must balance this with his duties as ruler of the Galactic Empire and as the center of the Fremen religion. Simultaneously, the outlying powers in the universe are growing restless with the new status quo. Several forces are at work and conspire together to undo Paul Atreides and reverse the events that led to his ascension to the throne. These forces include the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, 
who are vexed that they have lost control of their Kwisatz Haderach. The remnants of the displaced House Carino, the former occupants of the throne. The Spacing Guild, who are now under Paul's control due to his control over the Spice. And the many Tleilex, who have their own agenda. The Tleilex Sioux have sent the face dancer Skytail as their representative. Despite the murderous nature of the plot he hoped to devise, the thoughts of Skytail, the Tleilax Sioux face dancer, returned again and again to rueful compassion. I shall regret causing death and misery to Muad'Dib, he told himself. He kept this benignity carefully hidden from his fellow conspirators. Such feelings told him, though, that he found it easier to identify with the victim than with the attackers, a thing characteristic of Tleilaxu. Skytel stood in bemused silence, somewhat apart from the others. The argument about psychic poison had been going on for some time now. It was energetic and vehement, but polite, that blindly compulsive way that adepts of the great schools always adopted for matters close to their dogma. When you think you have him skewered right, then you find him unwounded. That was the old reverend mother of the Bene Gesserit, Gaius Helen Mohayim, their hostess here on Wallet 9. She was a black-robed stick figure, a witch crone seated in a floater chair at Skytail's left. Her Abba hood had been thrown back to expose a leathery face beneath silver hair. Deeply pocketed eyes stared out of skull mask features. They were using a Mirabasa language, honed phalange consonants and joined vowels. It was an instrument for conveying fine emotional subtleties. Edric, the guild steersman, replied to the Reverend Mother now with a vocal curtsy contained in a sneer, a lovely touch of disdainful politeness. Skytel looked at the guild envoy. Edric swam in a container of orange gas only a few paces away. His container sat in the center of the transparent dome which the Bene Gesserit had built for this meeting. The guildsman was an elongated figure vaguely humanoid with thin feet and hugely fan membranous hands, a fish in a strange sea. His tank's vents emitted a pale orange cloud, rich with the smell of the geriatric spice melange. If we go on this way, we'll die of stupidity. That was the fourth person present, a potential member of the conspiracy. Princess Irulan, wife but not mate, Skytail reminded himself, of their mutual foe. She stood at a corner of Edric's tank, a tall blonde beauty, splendid in a robe of blue whale fur and matching hat. Gold buttons glittered at her ears. She carried herself with an aristocrat's hauteur, but something in the absorbed smoothness of her features betrayed the controls of her Bene Gesserit background. The Atreides dynasty has become less secure due to Paul not producing an heir. At first, it is unclear why but it is later revealed that the Princess Irulan has been secretly administering contraceptives to Paul's lover and concubine Chani. When Irulan arrives back on Arrakis, after meeting with the conspirators, she confronts Paul about giving her a child, but he refuses. Chani later comes to Paul to ask if he will give Irulan what she wants, as she cannot conceive. Chani also knows that Irulan is up to something against them, and she wants Paul out of harm's way. Irulan is the wife of Paul only in name. Their marriage was made only so that Paul could have a claim to the imperial throne. Irulan Corino is the eldest daughter of Shaddam. She received her education through the Bene Gesserit. She was conditioned to be a lady of refinement and elegance. Shaddam IV very much expected Irulan to become empress after his death. The Bene Gesserit also saw potential in the princess and gave her sufficient training so that they could exploit her at some point in the future, were she to find herself in a position of power. Still, despite expectations, Irulan remained only an average Bene Gesserit adept, though she still maintained loyalty to the sisterhood. Irulan desires to bear the royal heir herself and preserve the Atreides bloodline for the Bene Gesserit but Paul will not touch her. Though Paul is aware of Irulan preventing Chani from conceiving, he allows it. He has foreseen in his prescience that the birth of his heir will bring about Chani's death, and he does not want to lose her. 
But things change once Chani eventually conceives, having switched to an ancient Fremen fertility diet. The Empire grows ever more unstable. The Spacing Guild is refusing to give over the location of the Tupal Entante, a sanctuary planet where defeated great houses can retreat to. Irulan suggests that they retaliate by cutting off the guild's access to spice, but her suggestion is almost unanimously shot down. Stilgar, however, does not understand why Paul cannot use his prescient power to locate Tupal. Paul explains to him that prescience is neither a gift nor power, but a natural consequence. You have certain powers, Stilgar said. Can you not locate the Entente despite the guild? Powers, Paul thought. Stilgar could just say, you're prescient. Can't you trace a path in the future that leads to Tupul? Paul looked at the golden surface of the table. Always the same problem. How could he express the limits of the inexpressible? Should he speak of fragmentation, the natural destiny of all power? How could someone who never experienced the spice change of prescience conceive an awareness containing no localized space-time? no personal image vector, nor associated sensory captives. He looked at Aaliyah, found her attention on Irulan. Aaliyah sensed his movement, glanced at him, nodded toward Irulan. Ah, yes. Any answer they gave would find its way into one of Irulan's special reports to the Bene Gesserit. They never gave up seeking an answer to their quiz at Sadarak. Stilgar, though, deserved an answer of some kind. For that matter, so did Irulan. The uninitiated tried to conceive of prescience as obeying a natural law, Paul said. He steepled his hands in front of him. But it'd be just as correct to say it's heaven speaking to us. That being able to read the future is a harmonious act of man's being. In other words, prediction is a natural consequence in the wave of the present. It wears the guise of nature, you see. But such powers cannot be used from an attitude that pre-states aims and purposes. Does a chip caught in the wave say where it's going? There is no cause and effect in the oracle. Cause becomes occasions of conveying convections and confluences, places where the currents meet. Accepting prescience, you feel your being with concepts are repugnant to intellect. Your intellectual consciousness therefore rejects them, and rejecting intellect becomes a part of the process and is subjugated. You cannot do it, Stilgar asked. Were I to seek to pile with prescience, Paul said, speaking directly to Irulan, this might hide to pile. Chaos, Irulan protested. It has no, no consistency. I did say it obeys no natural law, Paul said. Irulan is irritated by the lack of preciseness in Paul's vision. Stilgar merely cannot comprehend how Paul's godly powers could be limited in such a way. Many people of the Imperium are seeking constitution. They desire limits on Paul's imperial control. Paul's priest Korba suggests that constitution could begin as a religious one, but Paul rejects any idea of a constitution, calling it tyranny. According to Irulan, many in the Imperium have grown nostalgic, and they look back on the time in which her father Shaddam ruled as better days. Paul is grateful for her insight. The conspiracy against Paul Atreides is a complicated one. The guild navigator Edric is able to shield the conspiracy from Paul's prescience due to a property of prescience which causes oracles to interfere with each other's sight. The spacing guild has come to Arrakis and brought a gift for Paul. A gola of the dead Duncan Idaho, who was Paul's childhood teacher who died 14 years earlier on Arrakis in the novel Dune. They have named this gola Hate and also conditioned him as a mintat. They hope the presence of this Gola will undermine Paul's ability to rule by forcing Paul to question not only himself, but the empire he has created. The Gola also has another, even darker purpose. 
Paul's acceptance of the gift also weakens his support amongst the Fremen, who see the Tleilaxu and their tools as unclean. It was Duncan Idaho. It could not be Duncan Idaho, yet it was. Captive memories absorbed in the womb during that moment of her mother's spice change identified this man for Aaliyah by Rayana decipherment, which cut through all camouflage. Paul was seeing him, she knew. Out of countless personal experiences, out of gratitudes and youthful sharing, it was Duncan. Aaliyah shuddered. There could only be one answer. This was a Tleilaxu Gola, a being reconstructed from the dead flesh of the original. That original had perished saving Paul. This could only be a product of the axolotl tanks. The Gola walked with the cocked-footed alertness of a master swordsman. He came to a halt as the ambassador's tank glided to a stop, ten paces from the steps of the dais. In the Bene Gesserit way she could not escape, Aaliyah read Paul's disquiet. He no longer looked at the figure out of his past. Not looking, his whole being stared. Muscles strained against restrictions as he nodded to the guild ambassador, said, I am told your name is Edric. We welcome you to our court, in the hope that this will bring new understanding between us. The steersman assumed a sybaritic reclining pose in his orange gas, popped a melange capsule into his mouth before meeting Paul's gaze. The tiny transducer orbiting a corner of the guildsman's tank reproduced a coughing sound. Then the rasping, uninvolved voice. I abase myself before my emperor and beg leave to present my credentials and offer a small gift. An aide passed the scroll up to Stilgar who studied it, scowling, then nodded to Paul. Both Stilgar and Paul turned toward the Gola, standing patiently below the dais. Indeed, my emperor has discerned the gift, Edric said. We are pleased to accept your credentials, Paul said. Explain the gift. Edric rolled in the tank, bringing his attention to bear on the Gola. This man is called Hate, he said, spelling the name. According to our investigators, he has a most curious history. He was killed here on Arrakis, a grievous head wound which required many months of regrowth the body was sold to the Bene Tleilax as that of a master swordsman, an adept of the Gianna school. It came to our attention that this must be Duncan Idaho, the trusted retainer of your household. We brought him here as a gift befitting an emperor. Edric peered up at Paul. Is it not Idaho, sire? Restraint and caution gripped Paul's voice. He has the aspect of Idaho. Does Paul see something I don't? Aaliyah wondered. No, it's Duncan. The man called Hate stood impassively, metal eyes fixed straight ahead, body relaxed. No sign escaped him to indicate he knew himself to be the object of discussion. According to our best knowledge, it's Idaho, Edric said. He's called Hate now. Paul said, a curious name. Sire, there is no divining why the Tleilaxu bestow names, Edric said. But names can be changed. The Tleilaxu name is of little importance. This is a Tleilaxu thing, Paul thought. There's the problem. The Bene Tleilax held little attachment to phenomenal nature. Good and evil carried strange meanings in their philosophy. What might they have incorporated into Idaho's flesh, out of design or whim? Paul glanced at Stilgar, noted the Fremen's superstitious awe. It was an emotion echoed all through his Fremen guard. Stilgar's mind would be speculating about the loathsome habits of guildsmen, of Tleilaxu, and of Golas. Turning toward the Gola, Paul said, Hate, is that your only name? A serene smile spread over the Gola's dark features. The metal eyes lifted, centering on Paul, but maintained their mechanical stare. That's how I am called, my lord. Hate. The situation becomes even more complicated due to Paul's sister, Aaliyah, 
who is now maturing into a woman. Aaliyah is exceptionally powerful, with all the skills of a Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother. Aaliyah is irresistibly attracted to Hate, the Duncan Idaho Gola. Aaliyah and Hate investigate the appearance of a female corpse near the city Arakin. Hate, due to his computational abilities as a Mintat, realizes that the fact that no one has been reported as missing implies a Tleilaxu plot. They realize that the dead woman has likely been replaced by a face dancer. Sensing plans within plans, Paul demands to see the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohayim. She fears that Paul will kill her due to her part in the conspiracy, but instead she discovers that Paul wishes to bargain with her. He offers to produce a child with Irulan through artificial insemination. The Reverend Mother is disgusted, understanding that such an act would violate the Butlerian Jihad. And also she understands that no child born this way would be a candidate for the Golden Lion Throne. Still. The Bene Gesserit are desperate to regain control of the Atreides' genes, though if they admit it to the existence of such a child, it would jeopardize their own position within the Empire. The Reverend Mother decides that she must consult with the Sisterhood. Though Chani has conceived, her pregnancy begins to experience problems due to the contraceptives in her system. Chani immediately realizes that Irulan must be the culprit and would have killed her if not for Paul's intervention. Paul has spent more and more time with the Gola Hate. During this time, he realizes that it may even be possible to restore the Gola's original memories. Little does he know, this is precisely the key to the Tleilaxu plot surrounding the Gola Hate. In Dune, Paul trained a group of extremely deadly and extremely loyal death commandos known as the Feta King. In Dune Messiah, Otham, one of Paul's former commandos reveals evidence of a Fremen conspiracy against Paul. Many Fremen have grown disillusioned with the world that Muad'Dib has made. Otham's daughter, Lichna, comes to Paul and insists that her father has a message for him. He asks for Paul to meet with him in secret. Paul notices then that Lichna is not actually Lichna. She is a Talaxu face dancer, but Paul allows this to happen. He has seen this in his prescience. Otham gives Paul his Tleilaxu dwarf servant named Bijas, who has the ability to record faces, names, and details like a machine. Paul accepts Bijas reluctantly, though he is disturbed because he has not seen the dwarf in any vision. Bijas, Duri called. You call me? The dwarf stepped into the room from the courtyard, an alert expression of worry on his face. You have a new master, Bijaz, Duri said. She stared at Paul. You may call him Usul. Usul, that's the base of the pillar, Bijaz said, translating. How can Usul be base when I am the basest thing living? He always speaks thus, Otham apologized. I do not speak, Bijaz said. I operate a machine called language. It creaks and groans, but is mine own. A Tleilaxu toy, learned and alert, Paul thought. The Bene Tleilax never threw away something this valuable. He turned, studied the dwarf, round melange eyes, returned his stare. Shortly after Paul accepts Bijaz and sends him away with Stilgar, a stone burner is set off in Otham's home. It destroys the area and blinds many people, including Paul himself. But to the surprise of everyone else, especially the Fremen. Paul does not need eyes to see. According to Fremen tradition, the blind are abandoned in the desert, but Paul's oracular powers are such that he can foresee in his mind's eye everything that happens as if he had eyes. Paul shocks the Fremen, who take this as more evidence of his divinity. By following his visions perfectly, Paul can see even the most slight details around him. This only makes him appear more godlike to those around him, further establishing his divinity in the minds of many. But this is a curse. Becoming blind has forced Paul to never stray from his vision. He is unable to change even the smallest part of his destiny while maintaining his appearance as sighted. As the Fremen conspiracy comes to light, it is learned that Korba, 
former Fadekin warrior, who is now a high priest of Paul's church, is an enemy as well. As Fremen naives who are convinced of his innocence await in the hall, Aaliyah receives a letter from the Lady Jessica. A few naives had come out to observe the treatment accorded of fellow Fremen. They'd brought on the clamor, exciting Korba to protest his innocence. Aaliyah moved her gaze across the Fremen faces, trying to recapture memories of the original men. The present blotted out the past. They'd all become hedonist, samplers of pleasures most men couldn't even imagine. Their uneasy glances she saw strayed often to the doorway into the chamber where they would meet. They were thinking of Muad'Dib's blind sight, a new manifestation of mysterious powers. By their law, a blind man should be abandoned in the desert, his water given up to Shai Halud. But eyeless Muad'Dib saw them. They disliked buildings too, and felt vulnerable in space built above the ground. Give them a proper cave cut from rock, then they could relax. But not here, not with this new Muad'Dib waiting inside. As she turned to go down to the meeting, she saw the letter where she'd left it on the table by the door, the latest message from their mother. Despite the special reverence held for Caladan as the place of Paul's birth, the Lady Jessica had emphasized her refusal to make her planet a stop on the Hajj. No doubt my son is an epical figure of history, she'd written, but I cannot see this as an excuse for submitting to a rabble invasion. Aaliyah touched the letter, experienced an odd sensation of mutual contact. The paper had been in her mother's hands, such an archaic device, the letter, but personal in a way that no recording could achieve. Written in the Atreides' battle tongue, it represented an almost invulnerable privacy of communication. Thinking of her mother afflicted Aaliyah with the usual inward blurring. The spice change that had mixed the psyches of mother and daughter forced her at times to think of Paul as a son to whom she had given birth. The capsule of complex oneness could present her own father as a lover. Ghost shadows cavorted her mind, people of possibility. Aaliyah reviewed the letter as she walked down the ramp to the antechamber where her guard Amazons waited. You produce a deadly paradox, Jessica had written. Government cannot be religious and self-assertive at the same time. Religious experience needs a spontaneity which laws inevitably suppress, and you cannot govern without laws. Your laws eventually must replace morality, replace conscience, replace even the religion by which you think to govern. Sacred ritual must spring from praise and holy yearnings which hammer out a significant morality. Government, on the other hand, is a cultural organism particularly attracted to doubts, questions, and contentions. I see the day coming when ceremony must take the place of faith and symbolism replaces morality. Korba, who has now been brought to the gallery, has denied the allegations against him, claiming that he took no part in the conspiracy to take down Paul Atreides. Where is Muad'Dib? he asked. My brother has delegated me to preside as a reverend mother, Aaliyah said. Hearing this, the naives in the gallery begin raising their voices in protest. Silence, Aaliyah commanded. In the abrupt quiet, she said, Is it not Fremen law that a reverend mother presides when life and death are at issue? As the gravity of her statement penetrated, stillness came over the naibs. But Aaliyah marked angry stares across the rows of faces. She named them in her mind for a discussion in council. Horbors, Rafiri, Tasman, Sajid, Umbu, Leg. The names carried pieces of dune in them. Umbu Sich, Tasman Sink, Horbos Gap. She turned her attention to Korba. Observing her attention, Korba lifted his chin, said, I protest my innocence. His tongue flickered between his teeth as he spoke. Not by word or deed have I been traitor to my Fremen vows. I demand to confront my accuser. A simple enough protest, Aaliyah thought, and she saw that it had produced a considerable effect on the Naibs. They knew Korba. He was one of them. To become a naive, 
He proved his Fremen courage and caution. Not brilliant Korba, but reliable. Not one to lead a Jihad, perhaps, but a good choice as supply officer. Not a crusader, but one who cherished the old Fremen virtues. The tribe is paramount. Otham's bitter words, as Paul had recited them, swept through Aaliyah's mind. She scanned the gallery. Any of those men might see himself in Corpus' place, some for good reason, but an innocent naive was as dangerous as a guilty one here. Corba felt it too. Who accuses me? He demanded. I have a Fremen right to confront my accuser. Perhaps you accuse yourself, Aaliyah said. Before he could mask it, mystical terror lay briefly on Corba's face. It was there for anyone to read. With her powers, Aaliyah had but to accuse him herself, saying she brought the evidence from the Shadow Region, the Alam al Mithil. Our enemies have Fremen allies, Aaliyah pressed. Water traps have been destroyed, Kanats blasted, plantings poisoned, and storage basins plundered. And now they've stolen a worm from the desert, taken it to another world. The voice of this intrusion was known to all of them. Muad'Dib. Paul came through the doorway from the hall, pressed through the guard ranks and crossed to Aaliyah's side. Johnny accompanying him remained on the sidelines. My lord, Stilgar said, refusing to look at Paul's face. Paul aimed his empty sockets at the gallery, then down to Korba. What, Korba? No words of praise? Muttering could be heard in the gallery. It grew louder, isolated words and phrases audible. Law for the blind, Fremen way, in the desert, who breaks? Who says I am blind? Paul demanded. He faced the gallery. You, Rai Thiri, I see you're wearing gold today, and that blue shirt beneath it which still has dust on it from the streets. You always were untidy. Rai Thiri made a warding gesture, three fingers against evil. Point those fingers at yourself, Paul shouted. We know where the evil is. He turned back to Korba. There is guilt on your face, Korba. Not my guilt. I may have associated with the guilty, but no. He broke off, shot a frightened look at the gallery. Taking her cue from Paul, Aaliyah Rose stepped down to the floor of the chamber, advanced to the edge of Korba's table. From a range of less than a meter, she stared down at him, silent and intimidating. Korba cowered under the burden of eyes. He fidgeted, shot anxious glances at the gallery. Whose eyes do you seek up there? Paul asked. You cannot see, Korba blurted. I don't need eyes to see you, Paul said. And he began describing Korba. Every movement, every twitch, every alarmed pleading look at the gallery. Korba mustered a pitiful air of pomposity to plead. Who accuses me? Otham accuses you, Aaliyah said. But Otham's dead, Korba protested. How did you know that? Paul asked. Through your spy system? Oh yes, we know about your spies and couriers. We know who brought the stone burner here from Tarahel. It was for the defense of the Quizarat, Korba blurted. Is that how it got into your traitorous hands? Paul asked. It was stolen, and we... Korba fell silent swallowed. His gaze darted left and right. Everyone knows I have been the voice of love for Muad'Dib. He stared at the gallery. How can a dead man accuse a Fremen? Otham's voice isn't dead, Aaliyah said. She stopped as Paul touched her arm. Otham sent us his voice, Paul said. It gives the names, the acts of treachery, the meeting places and the times. Do you miss certain faces in the Council of Naibs, Korba? Where are Merker and Fash? Keek the Lame isn't with us today. And Takum? Where is he? Korba shook his head from side to side. They fled Arrakis with the stolen worm, Paul said. Even if I freed you now, Korba, Shai Halud would have your water for your part in this. Why don't I free you, Korba? Think of all those men whose eyes were taken, the men who cannot see as I see. They have families and friends, Korba. 
Where could you hide from them? It was an accident, Korba pleaded. Anyway, they're getting to Laxu. Again, he subsided. Who knows what bondage goes with metal eyes, Paul asked. The naives in their gallery began exchanging whispered comments, speaking behind raised hands. They gazed coldly at Korba now. Korba demands to face his accuser, but Paul says his accuser is Otham. They have his voice by way of Bijaz. The other Fremen conspirators have fled Arrakis with the worm they kidnapped. Korba insists that he be judged by Fremen law, and Stilgar agrees, because he plans to take care of Korba himself later. Aaliyah realizes that this was a plan between Paul and Stilgar to flush out the other traitors. As hate, the Duncan Idaho Gola interrogates the dwarf Bijaz later, the Tleilaxu plot pans out. Hate had been implanted with a secret command even he was not aware of. It is revealed that Bijaz was secretly a Tleilaxu master with a hidden purpose. By use of an extremely specific humming intonation, Bijaz implants conditioning that will force Duncan to kill Paul in the appropriate instance. After this interrogation, Duncan remembers none of this. Aaliyah has grown frustrated. She wishes to see as her brother Paul sees. She has consumed an enormous dose of spice in an attempt to induce spice trance. Hate finds her in this state. She tells him that the Bene Gesserit are hoping to get their breeding program back in line by getting Paul's child, or hers, though she cannot see who the father of her child will be however. Hate realizes that she is likely overdosed on Spice, and he could not bear the thought of Aaliyah's death. He wants to call for a doctor. Aaliyah realizes in that moment that the Gola loves her, and the doctor is called to help with her overdose. Aaliyah tells Hate that she wishes she were not a part of Paul's story, that she wants the ability to laugh and love. She also asks Duncan if he loves her, and he admits that he does. He tries to get her to sleep, but she tells him about the plot against Paul and how bad it has become. She drifts off thinking of the child she will have one day, and how that child will be preborn, just as she was. As Chani's time to give birth nears, Paul and Chani journey to Siege Tabur with a group of odd companions. Bijaz, the Tleilaxu dwarf, the Gola hate, Edric, the guild steersman ambassador, Gaius Helen Mohayim, the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother, Lichna, Otham's strange daughter, who Paul knew was secretly the Tleilaxu face dancer Skytel, Stilgar and his favorite wife Hera, the Princess Irulan, and Aaliyah. Chani is confused as to why Paul has brought so many with them into the desert, including enemies. As Chani looks out into the desert near the siege where she will give birth, Hate insists that she must come inside to avoid the coming sandstorm. For some reason, Hate is gripped by the fear that Chani will die and that Paul will tell him so. He does not yet understand that the panic is due to his Tleilaxu conditioning, which was activated earlier by the dwarf Bajaz. Chani dies giving birth. Once Paul receives the news, the grief of his loss is too much to bear. Paul stumbles and is truly blind now. Having removed himself from the prison of his own precise vision, Paul's reaction to Chani's death finally triggers Hate's compulsion and he attempts to kill Paul by stabbing him with a knife. However, the inner turmoil is so great that Duncan Idaho's Gola body reacts against its own programming and recovers Duncan's full consciousness. He now remembers his previous life and is no longer bound to Tleilaxu programming. Paul discovers that Chani has given birth to twins. They are pre-born, just as his sister Aaliyah was, born into the world with access to ancestral memories. Thanks to the combinations of their genes and Chani's consumption of spice while pregnant, Paul is shocked that in no vision had he foreseen twins. Lichna, who reveals herself to be the Tleilaxu face dancer Skytel, offers to revive Chani as a Gola in exchange for all of Paul's Chome Company holdings. This was the Tleilaxu plot from the beginning, to convince Paul that the memories of a Gola could be reawakened, and to use this as leverage upon Chani's death. 
I am Skytel, a Tleilaxu of the Face Dancers, and I would know a thing before we bargain. Is that Agola I see behind you, or Duncan Idaho? It's Duncan Idaho, Paul said, and I will not bargain with you. I think you'll bargain, Skytel said. Duncan, Paul said, speaking over his shoulder, will you kill this Tleilaxu if I ask? Yes, my lord. There was the suppressed rage of a berserker in Idaho's voice. Wait, Elias said. You don't know what you're rejecting. But I do know, Paul said. So it's truly Duncan Idaho of the Atreides, Skytel said. We found the lever. Agola can regain his past. Paul heard footsteps. Something brushed past him on the left. Skytel's voice came from behind him now. What do you remember of your past, Duncan? Everything. From my childhood on. I even remember you at the tank when they removed me from it, Idaho said. Wonderful, Skytel breathed. Wonderful. Paul heard the voice moving. I need a vision, he thought. Darkness frustrated him. Bene Gesserit training warned him of terrifying menace in Skytel, yet the creature remained a voice, a shadow of movement, entirely beyond him. Are these the Atreides babies? Skytel asked. Hera, Paul cried. Get her away from there. Stay where you are, Skytel shouted. All of you, I warn you. A face dancer can move faster than you suspect. My knight can have both these lives before you touch me. Paul felt someone touch his right arm, then move to the right. That's far enough, Aaliyah, Skytel said. Aaliyah, Paul said. Don't. It's my fault, Aaliyah groaned. My fault, Atreides, Skytel said. Shall we bargain now? Behind him, Paul heard a single hoarse curse, his throat constricted at the suppressed violence in Idaho's voice. Idaho must not break. Skytel would kill the babies. To strike a bargain, one requires a thing to sell, Skytel said. Not so, Atreides. Will you have your Chani back? We can restore her to you. Agola, Atreides. Agola with full memory. But we must hurry. Call your friends to bring a cryologic tank to preserve the flesh. To hear Chani's voice once more, Paul thought. To feel her presence beside me. Ah. That's why they gave me Idaho as a Gola, to let me discover how much the recreation is like the original. But now, full restoration, at their price, I'd be a Tleilaxu tool forevermore, and Chani, chained to the same fate by a threat to our children, exposed once more to the Quizarat's plotting. What pressures would you use to restore Chani's memories to her? Paul asked fighting to keep his voice calm. Would you condition her to kill one of her own children? We use whatever pressures we need, Skytel said. What say you, Atreides? Aaliyah, Paul said, bargain with this thing. I cannot bargain with what I cannot see. A wise choice, Skytel gloated. Well, Aaliyah, what do you offer me as your brother's agent? Paul lowered his head, bringing himself to stillness within stillness. He glimpsed something just then, like a vision but not a vision. It had been a knife close to him. There. Give me a moment to think, Elias said. My knife is patient, Skytel said, but Chani's flesh is not. Take a reasonable amount of time. Paul felt himself blinking. It could not be, but it was. He felt eyes. Their vantage point was odd. They moved in an erratic way. There, the knife swam in his view. With the breath stealing shock, Paul recognized the viewpoint. It was that of one of his children. He was seeing Skytel's knife hand from within the crash. It glittered only inches from him. Yes, and he could see himself across the room as well, head down. Standing quietly, a figure of no menace, ignored by the others in this room. To begin, 
You might assign us all your Chelm holdings, Skytel suggested. All of them, Aaliyah protested. All. Watching himself through the eyes in the crash, Paul slipped his Chris knife from his belt sheath. The movement produced a strange sensation of duality. He measured the distance, the angle. There'd be no second chance. He prepared his body then, in the Bene Gesserit way, armed himself like a cocked spring for a single concentrated movement, a prana thing, requiring all his muscles balanced in one exquisite unity. The Chris knife leaped from his hand. The milky blur of it flashed into Skytel's right eye, jerked the face dancer's head back. Skytel threw both hands up and staggered backwards against the wall. His knife clattered off the ceiling to hit the floor. Skytel rebounded from the wall. He fell face forward, dead before he touched the floor. The reawakening of Duncan's memories confirms to Paul that it is indeed possible to restore Chani as she once was. Still, Paul refuses, understanding that even if they were to bring Chani back, the Tleilaxu would likely program the Gola in some diabolical way, as they did with Duncan. Though Paul is blind due to escaping his oracular trap, he manages to kill Skytel with a dagger by tapping into the vision of his preborn son. Paul names the boy child Leto for his father, and the girl Ganima, meaning spoil of war. Bijaz comes in and insists that the plan succeeded despite Skytel's death. The Tleilaxu knew that Idaho thought of Paul as the son he never had, so he would not kill him if he resurfaced. He offers again to restore Chani, and Paul is more tempted than before. He orders Duncan to kill Bijaz to prevent this, and Duncan does. Now that Paul is truly blind, both prophetically and literally, he chooses to embrace Fremen tradition. He walks into the desert alone. His children will now inherit his empire. Until the children come of age, Aaliyah will rule as regent. Duncan does not believe that Paul will perish in the desert, but no one can say for sure. Aaliyah is furious after the loss of Paul. She has Edric, the guild navigator, executed for his part in the conspiracy. The Reverend Mother Gaius is also executed, despite Paul's previous orders to spare her life. Aaliyah is racked with grief, calling her brother a fool for giving in to this path. She has had no more vision since the death of Chani. Irulan now insists that she loved Paul, but never knew it. Irulan has promised to renounce the Bene Gesserit, and spend her life training Paul's children. Aaliyah can sense Irulan's sincerity. Duncan realizes that now the Bene Gesserit have no hold on any of the Atreides' heirs, with Irulan on their side. Aaliyah pleads with Duncan to love her, and tells him that she loves him. He does, and agrees to follow her wherever she leads him. Dune Messiah was not the novel that people expected after the epic that was Dune. Messiah is meant to illustrate that the life of Muad'Dib was a tragic one. Paul is no true savior, any more than he is a deity. He did what he believed he had to do, but still ultimately just traded one brand of tyranny for another. Paul insists in this novel that people prefer tyrants to kind rulers. He argues that freedom results in chaos. In Dune Messiah we observe a society where this idea has subsumed an empire of billions and resulted in unimaginable slaughter. But this book is not only an argument against making individuals into gods, it is also critiquing a system by which people are conditioned to accept such individuals. Taking into account the long view of history, Paul can be blamed for some of the slaughter which fell upon the universe, but not all of it. There is a system in place which led to his rise. The entirety of the myth-making and legend seeding that the Bene Gesserit started before he was even born. Without religions, without legends, without prophecy, the rule of Paul Muad'Dib would have never come to pass, and 61 billion lives would have been saved. The message of Dune Messiah in a nutshell 
never give your faculties away to a charismatic leader. Dune Messiah sets up Children of Dune, ending with the birth of Paul's pre-born children, Leto II and Ganema, who will become the future rulers of the Imperium. Leto will continue the golden path that Paul abandoned. He will maneuver fate and transcend time like Paul never could.